A new Pokemon Sun and Moon trailer has released, and it is filled to the brim with new information. Not only have we learned about new Pokemon and new Pokemon forms specific to the Alola region, but Pokemon can have Z-moves as well. And Alola itself offers a completely different challenge compared to the regions in the past. There's a ton to see, but thankfully we have the old analysis machine to help us find every secret in hidden detail. Of course, be sure to watch our previous analyses on Pokemon Sun and Moon, as we'll be referring back to them throughout. Let's begin with the introduction of new Pokemon forms. Essentially, the Alola region has had an effect on certain Pokemon so that their typing and appearance changes. They're still considered the same Pokemon, but their habitat has changed a lot about them and that's no more obvious than with Executor. The new Alola form has a massively elongated neck so that it looks more like a palm tree. Its typing has also been changed from Grass and Psychic to Grass and Dragon, and its ability is now Frisk rather than Chlorophyll or Harvest. This change is said to be brought about by Alola itself since strong sunlight pours down all year round. It's actually a point of pride for the people of Alola since they boast that the Alolan Executor is its true form. This may be a reference to the artwork from the Jungle Booster box that was released in Japan for the trading card game. It's here that Executor was depicted with the same long neck. Perhaps this design was planned all along. After all, Executor is the favorite Pokemon of the Pokemon Company CEO and President Sunikazu Ishihara. Maybe he pushed for this design. So, just how much taller is this Executor? Well, the normal form is about 6 feet tall, while the Alolan form is nearly 36 feet high. That's a 30 foot growth spurt. The Pokemon website goes on to say that the Alolan Executor has a fourth head on its tail. This head can control the tail independently and will take on opponents to the rear that can't be reached by the main head's attacks. It excels at whipping its long neck like a lash to attack with its hard heads, but the neck can sometimes be a weakness. The website doesn't elaborate on what this weakness may be, though we imagine the neck isn't the most flexible. In none of its animations do we ever see the neck bend more than a little. We should also note that it doesn't seem like Execute has a specific Alola form. In the Japanese trailer, it just shows a normal Execute evolving, unlike the other Alolan Pokemon we see later. We're not sure if this means Execute will always evolve into the Alolan Executor, or if it must be evolved in a spot with lots of sunlight, similar to how Glaceon has to be evolved near an ice rock. Next, we have the Alolan forms for Vulpix and Ninetales. Both lose their fire typing and instead become ice types. Ninetales even gains a secondary fairy type. They both have the ability Snow Cloak, which raises their evasion during a hailstorm. Thanks to the Pokemon website, we know that it's said that Vulpix came to the Alola region together with humans. Eventually, the Vulpix moved to the snowy mountain peaks to avoid the normal habitats of other Pokemon since they didn't want to intrude. After some time passed, the Vulpix ended up taking this new ice form, living on the high mountains that remain covered in snow all year. Its design may be inspired by Arctic foxes, who have white fur rather than the traditional red. The Vulpix live in small packs of two to five, helping each other survive. They are able to freeze anything solid by expelling breath at a temperature of negative 58 degrees Fahrenheit. Unfortunately, it doesn't fare well in the heat, but if the temperature becomes too hot, it will produce ice from its tail in order to cool the surrounding area. Unlike Executor, Vulpix's height and weight is no different compared to the standard Vulpix. And this applies to Ninetales as well which sees no changes to its size. However, Ninetales do live on a snowy peak that is revered in the Alola region as a holy mountain. We would assume that this snowy mountain is on the southwest island, but it seems strange that an observatory would be placed so close to a holy location. Though, it may just be far enough away to not infringe on those customs. At any rate, Ninetales are treated as sacred emissaries, causing people to meet them with a mix of awe and fear. Despite this, the Alolan Ninetales personality is very gentle and has sometimes helped humans who seem to be in distress. However, if anything damages its territory, it will show no mercy. It does this by producing ice crystals from its fur. Ninetales can use these crystals to block attacks or form balls of ice with which to fire like bullets at any opponent. These ice balls are so powerful that they can pulverize rocks. Finally, we have Alolan forms for Sandshrew and Sandslash. Both have an ice and steel typing as well as the snow cloak ability. 
In describing the Alolan Sandshrew, the Pokemon website states that Sandshrew have historically lived in desert areas. However, the frequent eruptions of surrounding volcanoes drove the Sandshrew to abandon the desert and travel to the snow-covered mountains. In time, their form changed to match their habitat. Arctic and tundra shrews do exist, though they lack the white fur of Arctic foxes. And none of them look quite like the Alolan Sandshrew. Sandshrew's body changed to adapt to the harsh environment of the snowy mountains. It has a steel-like shell of ice covering its skin, which has the appearance of an igloo. This makes it excel at defense, but it lacks the flexibility of the standard Sandshrew and is unable to curl into a ball. Its heavy weight, which is nearly four times that of the ground-type Sandshrew, makes it slower than its warmer cousin. But the claws on its hands and feet allow it to move across ice without slipping. If it wants to move quickly, it slides across ice on its belly just like a curling rock. Looking at this description, we can safely presume that the Alolan Sandshrew will have different stats compared to its usual counterpart. It will have higher defense, but lower speed, making it more of a defensive tank. The Alolan Sandslash continues this trend with spiny backs that are covered in ice. And thanks to this coating, the spines are even larger and sharper. Still, the Alolan Sandslash will hide themselves in the snow when strong enemies appear, making sure to only leave their needles exposed. These icy spines make the Sandslash much heavier though, nearly twice as heavy as a standard Sandslash, causing them to be even slower. However, in snowfields and on ice, they can move swiftly thanks to the paths they create with their claws. These claws are shaped differently, having hooks that allow them to dig into ice like picks. In fact, the sprays of snow kicked up by the Alolan Sandslash's movements can be so beautiful that many photographers try to capture the moment on film. However, because the Sandslash lived deep in the mountains, there's a chance that these photographers could become stranded. Express permission is required to even climb some of the mountains. Guess we just need to wait for Professor Oak to build a track. Then, it'll be a snap. Those are just the new forms of old Pokemon, though. There are quite a few new Pokemon introduced in the trailer, including one that has a few forms of its own. This is Oricorio, the dancing Pokemon, which has a unique style and dance that's determined by the island that it's on. According to the Pokemon website, it changes this form by sipping the nectar of certain flowers. So, because it has four different forms and there are four islands in Alola, it seems that a different Oricorio lives on each island based on the flowers unique to that island. The first style we see is Bele, which makes it a fire and flying type. Its dance is based on the flamenco, and Bele even means dance in Spanish. It even looks like a traditional flamenco dancer. The Bele style of Oricorio is very passionate, and power fills its body when it dances. It actually sends a downy fluff flying during its more intense dances, and by igniting this material, it can unleash a fiery dancing attack. We see Oricorio dance in this way at one point in the trailer, and we think we know where it may be. It features a dock, yet it's over a huge field of what looks to be red flowers. And on the map, in the swamp-like area of the third island, is an area with red all over, and what appears to be a wooden path leading to the arena on the right. We believe that these are the flowers that change Oricorio to the Bele style. And Oricorio itself may be a clue to what each island is called, but we'll get to that a little later. The next style is the Pom Pom, which makes it an electric and flying type. Pom Pom references the pom poms used in cheerleading, and its dance reflects that. This style of Oricorio is also very friendly toward people, and will use its dancing to encourage trainers that are feeling glum. It will literally become your personal cheerleader. As it dances, its feathers become charged with static electricity. It can then attack with these charged feathers, sometimes unleashing a powerful electric shock. We see the Pom Pom Oricorio dancing in a yellow flower field that we've seen before and we're pretty sure these are the flowers that change Oricorio to this style. Then, there's the Pau style, which is a psychic and flying type inspired by hula dancing. Even the name Pau is a reference to the wrapped skirts that performers wear during the dance. This style of Oricorio acts at its own pace, which can make it difficult to deal with for some trainers. It sharpens its spirited moves through dance, which in turn increases its psychic power. The dances it performs are meant to express gratitude to the guardian deity Pokemon of Alola, like Tapu Koko. 
We see it dancing during the trailer in a grassy area with a volcano in the distance, likely marking this as the Northeast Island. Finally, there's the Sensu-style Orokoryo, which is a dual ghost and flying type. The style is based on Japanese fan dances, and Sensu is even a reference to a type of Japanese fan. This form of Orokoryo is quiet and collected. Thanks to its dance, it's able to gather the spirits drifting around an area and borrow their power to fight. It's said that people who come to Alola from Kanto have a great liking for Sensu-style Orokoryo because its dance reminds them of their homeland. It's a nice callback, but Orokoryo's ghost typing makes us wonder if these people are from Lavender Town. Those guys just love spooky things. When we see the Sensu Orokoryo dance in the trailer, we can see violet flowers hanging behind it. Once again, these are likely the flowers that give Orokoryo this style. But all Orokoryo have a few things in common. For one, they are the only Pokémon who can learn the new move, Revelation Dance. It's a move that has different typing based on the current style of the Orokoryo. So while Pom Pom Orokoryo's Revelation Dance will be an electric move, Sensu's will be a ghost type move. They also have the new Dancer ability, which allows them to immediately use the same dance move used by another Pokémon on the field, which could be very useful in double battles. After all, one Pokémon could use Swords Dance, and so would Orokoryo, who could then use its own move, giving it two moves per turn in these cases. That's just Orokoryo, though. In addition to that dancing diva, there's Minior, the Meteor Pokémon. It's a rock and flying type that's formed in the stratosphere. They survive by absorbing the debris around them and, after consuming a large enough quantity of particles, their bodies will become heavy, eventually falling toward the planet's surface. The unique thing about Minior, though, is its body. It has a hard and heavy outer shell with a core inside it. While the shell is intact, it will have higher defense, but be slower. However, it's possible for this shell to break. This is part of its brand new ability, Shields Down, which grants it excellent defensive capabilities, even protecting against status conditions, as long as the shell is still there. But once its HP drops below half, the shell will break away, and Minior will change its battle style to something that hits harder and faster. However, there's no way to know what color its softcore body will be until the shell breaks. The Pokémon website explains that its color changes depending on the color of the debris it absorbed. Many think that its pastel coloration is cute and will often use Minior as a design motif for clothing and accessories. Next up is Gumshoes, the stakeout Pokémon and the evolved form of Young Goose. Unlike its pre-evolution, Gumshoe's method of hunting is to stake out its prey's usual roots and wait patiently until it comes by. It's been described as quite tenacious, which may be why it targets one prey for so long without stopping. However, it does run low on stamina when the sun goes down and will fall asleep in the exact same spot. Fortunately, it can withstand a great deal of hunger and will keep perfectly still, keeping watch without eating anything else. Gumshoe's appearance is actually close to that of a detective, with its arms folded behind its back and its stakeout ability. Even its name is inspired by detectives, and its hair is shaped like an English driving cab. Don't worry everyone, Gumshoe's is on the case. Then we have Fomantis, the sickle grass Pokémon, and a pure grass type. Fomantis is actually nocturnal, and performs photosynthesis while it sleeps during the day by spreading its leaves out in all directions. But due to the danger of staying in the same spot two days in a row, Fomantis will begin its search for the next day's spot as soon as the sun sets. There's a reason this is so important, though. The photosynthesis isn't just for energy, but a necessity for it to achieve the strength and bright coloration of its evolution. Because of this, Fomantis will attack anything that gets in the way of this process. Fomantis has the ability Leaf Guard, and it is said to excel at long-range moves like Razor Leaf and Solar Beam. However, because Solar Beam uses the energy that Fomantis stored through photosynthesis, it would prefer not to use it if possible. Eventually, Fomantis will evolve into Lorantis, which keeps the pure grass type and Leaf Guard ability. Lorantis, known as the Bloomsickle Pokémon, is able to draw opponents close thanks to its flower-like appearance and aroma, before taking them down. Many have said that Lorantis is the most beautiful of all grass-type Pokémon because of its brilliant coloration and elegant moves. It will trust trainers who take good care of it, but it has a tough time growing close to trainers that fail to do this. 
Lorantis also has the brand new move Solar Blade, which releases a blade-shaped beam to cut up its foes. It's said to be so sharp that it can slice a rock in half. Like Solar Beam, Lorantis must absorb energy from the sun on the first move before unleashing the blade on the second turn. We suspect that this is likely the physical equivalent to Solar Beam, and similar to that move, it can probably use Sunny Day to unleash Solar Blade in a single turn. Remember when we said that the color of Oracorio's styles could offer up the names of the other islands of Alola? Lorantis is the second part of this puzzle. The Pokemon website states that Lorantis is the totem Pokemon of Lush Jungle, which is the site of an Akala Island trial, where it will overwhelm trial goers with powerful combos and unleashes with the Pokemon allies it calls. The fact that it's the totem Pokemon of Lush Jungle is interesting all by itself and will become important when we cover the trial captains. But for now, we just learned the name of another Alola Island, Akala. And Akala is the Hawaiian word for pink, the same color as the Pau style Oracorio. Now while its dancing scene in the trailer didn't show a pink flower, it did reveal a volcano in the background. And the most obvious volcano in Alola is the Northeast Island. In other words, that island is Akala Island. Going even further, Mele Mele in Hawaiian means yellow the same color as Pom Pom style Oricorio, which very likely means that this Oricorio is found on Mele Mele Island. So we think you know what this means. Before, we stated we located the red flowers that surrounded the Bele style Oricorio on the southeastern island of Alola. Taking both of these into account, we believe this island will be called Ula Ula Island since that is the Hawaiian word for red. That just leaves the Sensu style Oricorio and the southwestern island. Both the Oricorio and the flowers behind it are violet, and the Hawaiian word for that is pony. So the final island is Pony Island. To recap, Mele Mele Island is the northwestern island, Akala Island is to the northeast, Ula Ula Island is to the southeast, and Pony Island is in the southwest. We're almost completely positive that this is the case. But there's still one more new Pokemon left, Mudbray. It is known as the Donkey Pokemon and is a pre-evolution to Mudsdale. Like Mudsdale, Mudbray is a pure ground type with the ability's own tempo or stamina. The Pokemon website states that Mudbray could once be found all over the world, but it was overhunted to the point of near extinction. Because of this, Alola is the only place in the world where Mudbray can still be found in the wild. It also has superhuman strength, which is a surprise to many considering its small body. It's able to carry loads up to 50 times its own weight, either on its back or dragging behind it. Mudbray adores playing in the mud, and it's very easy to live harmoniously with it as long as you provide an environment where it has access to mud. If it can't frolic like this, then Mudbray will become stressed and may even stop listening to orders. And the trailer may have provided us the location of where Mudbray can be found. We can see fences and hay bales behind it, which indicates a farm. The most obvious farm on the map is on the northeastern island of Akala, so you'll be able to catch it there. There's more that can be done with Pokemon in Alola though. An aspect of the culture of the region is Poke Ride, which allows people to use certain Pokemon to reach places typically inaccessible to humans. The key thing though is that these Pokemon don't join your team. However, you can call on them anytime to receive their help. Doing this is seen as typical in Alola since people and Pokemon are so bound together. The way this description from the Pokemon website reads, it seems as if Poke Rides will completely negate the need for HMs. After all, we see the trainer use a Tauros to break through rocks that would normally require a Rock Smash. These rocks are also larger than previous blockades, meaning they're likely resized for the ride Pokemon. But they could be used to find secrets as well, it seems. After breaking through the rocks that were blocking the path, the Tauros heads for another rock that doesn't seem to be obstructing anything. Perhaps unique Pokemon can be encountered, like with what normally happens when Rock Smash is used. Or maybe items can be found as well. And perhaps Pokemon battles can still happen if Tauros runs through the tall grass. We think that might be the case. Otherwise, there doesn't seem to be a point to using Mudsdale to cross this rocky terrain. Just below the trainer is some tall grass that doesn't seem to contain those rocks, so players should be able to just run through there instead. At least, that might be the case. 
In the Japanese trailer, we get a better look at Mudsdale crossing the rocky paths of this area, and it seems like using Mudsdale really is the only option. So perhaps Poke Rides are required sometimes, but not always, just like HMs. But that still leaves us wondering if wild battles can occur while using the Poke Ride. Well, we think they can. After all, wild encounters and trainer battles still happen while using Surf. This is no different, it's just on land. And speaking of surf, we can see the trainer once again using a Sharpedo to surf across the water. But what's especially unique is how Sharpedo is able to smash through rocks as well. Could it be that players need to earn a kind of license in order to use certain ride Pokemon? Otherwise, what would be the point of blocking things off if not to encourage players to return once they're able, much in the same way as obtaining HMs in past games? Now there is a screenshot of the trainer riding on Mudsdale on Route 2. This could indicate that you can use ride Pokemon very early in the game, or the trainer has returned the Route 2 after being allowed to use Mudsdale. It's difficult to say for sure. In addition, the Japanese trailer indicates why players would want to ride each Pokemon. We already know that Tauros can be used for speed and breaking through rocks, while Mudsdale is great for crossing rough terrain. But here we see that Stoutland is used to search out hidden items. We can see it sniffing the ground with a green exclamation point above its head, indicating that it's close to something. When the scene shifts to a clearing with Tauros nearby, the exclamation becomes red and Stoutland begins to bark, indicating that something is near. This might fully replace the dowsing machine from previous games. Finally, we see that Charizard is a ride Pokemon too. We just wonder if it could replace Fly from previous generations, or if this is how Soaring is handled from Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire. All we see is the trainer jumping on before flying off, making it impossible to decisively say which it is. But the artwork for Poke Rides does make us curious. It shows the trainer holding a green device with a hole on top and a plug. In his hand is a Pokeball we've never seen before, and on its front is a slot that would fit in the plug. So we think that the device serves as the request service, and Poke Rides will transfer the Pokemon that was asked for into the Ride Ball, as we've decided to call the unknown Pokeball. It's basically a portable PC, except you never own the Ride Pokemon. Potentially getting rid of HMs in favor of Ride Pokemon may be big. But the new island challenge seems to be where Pokemon Sun and Moon is really changing things. The Pokemon website constantly reminds you of just how different Alola is from other regions. It's surrounded by the sea. It has an extremely diverse ecology made up of Pokemon native to the region for a long time, along with Pokemon that have only recently arrived from other regions. Because of this, humans and Pokemon coexist in a close relationship in Alola, creating a culture that's quite unique. So instead of challenging eight gym leaders, in Alola, trainers must embark on a rite of passage that involves traveling through each of the four islands. The idea is that it helps young people grow into excellent Pokemon trainers, and as such, this will be the player's primary challenge. After all, as Professor Kukui explains, the goal is to complete the challenge and become Island Challenge Champion. So it's similar to the Gym Challenge of the past in terms of the goal, but seemingly very different when it comes to the journey. So, how does the Island Challenge work? Well, trainers have to overcome special trials that wait for them on each island. However, the trials aren't limited to simple Pokemon battles. They can take a variety of forms depending on the trial captain, like finding specific items or challenging your knowledge. The Pokemon website claims that they won't be able to be completed through ordinary methods. We're not exactly sure what they might be referring to, but let's take a look at the trial captains. A trial captain's role is to provide guidance to those attempting the island challenge. All of them are trainers who once took on the trials themselves in years before. Before we meet the first trial captain in the trailer though, we're shown the same dark forest again, which is now confirmed to be part of a trial. We then meet Mallow, who seems to be the trial captain of this forest, which she calls Lush Jungle, and should sound familiar to you from earlier in the analysis. That's right, Lush Jungle was mentioned by the Pokemon website as the location of the Totem Pokemon battle against Lorantis which we'll detail soon. And since Lush Jungle is said to be on Akala Island, that means Mallow is not the first trial captain players will face. Mallow is said to be an expert of grass-type Pokemon and loves to cook, as evidenced by the ladle in her portrait. 
However, it seems that her taste can be a bit particular at times, which seems to tie into her trial as she asks the trainer to find four ingredients for her. We think this might be the glittering object in Lush Jungle, though that only accounts for one. The Japanese trailer actually shows what we believe may be the entrance to Lush Jungle, though we can't locate the totems on either side anywhere on the map, making it difficult to pinpoint this jungle. Another scene in the jungle from this portion of the trailer shows the trainer riding on a Stoutland as it searches for an item. It may be that Stoutland is required to complete the trial. After all, these aren't something that can be done with normal methods and is supposed to increase the bond between people and Pokemon. Another scene shows the player talking to Mallow in a town, which we believe to be the one closest to the docks on Akala Island. We can see the same rounded building next to a blue-roofed building behind her. Mallow seems to be greeting the trainer as soon as he got off the boat to Akala Island. This could mean Lush Jungle is either near this town or on the tip of the island just south of the town. However, we next see her in a fenced-in pen with Tauros and Miltank, which could be the same place the trainer was riding Stoutland earlier, as well as where he battled Mudbray. This would put the Lush Jungle closer to this farm, the only place where we see fences like this. Unless this is a scene that takes place after your trial with Mallow. It's hard to pinpoint for sure. Before we move on, Mallow also confirms that a piece of concept art that's been floating around for quite some time is likely true. Up until this point, it hasn't been confirmed or discredited, but it showed what could be the final evolutions of Rowlet, Litten, and Poplio. Rowlet would be based on an archer, Litten on a wrestler, and Poplio on a performer. And if you look at a small sketch of Litten's final evolution, you can clearly see Mallow sitting next to the sleeping Pokemon. So these are likely what the starters will become. However, if you want to see the sketches yourself, click on the link in the description as the artwork has been targeted for takedown on many sites. The next trial captain we meet is Lana, who specializes in water-type Pokemon. The Pokemon website claims she is dedicated to her family and is a reliable older sister who watches over her younger sisters. Now, while we see in her artwork that she's carrying a fishing pole, we don't think that will be part of her trial. During the trailer, she talks about a Pokemon who is vigorously splashing and surmises that it must be quite fearsome. Now, this doesn't indicate much on its own, but there's a screenshot of Lana with the text, Trial Start, in front of her. But more interesting is the background where we can see the coast and the fact that it's raining. This ties into another screenshot where the trainer is riding a Lapras while it's raining and the sky is dark. We can see a waterfall in the background while a huge spray of water bursts upward. It seems like Lana's trial is to calm whatever Pokemon this may be, which is basically confirmed by the Japanese trailer. In it, we see the screenshot of the trainer with Lana in the rain play out. She says that her trial is called the Dawn of the Sea, as in, the Boss of the Sea. The next line then says that the player must defeat this Pokemon. Another scene shows the trainer riding Lapras in the rain near the same area as the screenshot of the bursting water. Based on both these moments and others in the Japanese trailer, we think we know where Lana's trial will take place. In this scene, there's a small dock behind her and a beach on the other side. While not exact, we do think this may be where all of the water basins are in the northern part of Akala Island. The trainer is even riding Lapras around this section, and we can see the small waterfall nearby. While Mele Mele Island has its own waterfall, it is much higher than the one in this stormy scene. At any rate, Lana says something about a water lily before the scene shifts to a wider shot. She asks the trainer to join her, though we're more interested in what appears to be a map on the right. We're not sure what the map shows, though. It doesn't seem to be based on anything in Alola, as far as we can tell, and it seems reminiscent of a sign that provides history of a local area, though we can't say this is what it is conclusively. Maybe it's an undersea map? Or perhaps it's a map of a previous region, though it doesn't seem to match any of them. The third trial captain introduced is Sophocles, who specializes in electric-type Pokémon. His clothes are pretty interesting right off the bat, as he's wearing a scarf shaped like a Pikachu's tail, and his shirt features a classic Game Boy with a link cable. His belt is of a D-pad with the up direction highlighted, while he has figures that clip to his belt loops like Electrode and Pikachu. He's surrounded by electronics, whiteboards, and machinery, which likely tie into the fact that he's good with mechanics and probably built many of those machines. But the oddest thing about him is his name. 
Sophocles was the Athenian playwright most famous for Oedipus Rex, and doesn't seem to have any connection to machines or electricity at all. The best we could find for why this name might have been chosen is the fact that one of his plays was called Electra, though that was just a character's name. It honestly has us a bit baffled. His personality seems short and to the point, as he states that his trial will begin right there, right now. In a short scene from the Japanese trailer, he declares the Mark II version of one of his inventions to switch on, though we don't see it. Another moment from a different angle has him mention that something would no longer speak well. There aren't really any clues to what his trial could be or even where Sophocles is located, making him the biggest mystery of the four captains. The final trial captain introduced is Kieve, who specializes in fire types. Kiave's name is a type of tree that's found in Hawaii and is often used for firewood and charcoal. Fittingly, he's waiting on top of a volcano which places him on Akala Island. But here's the intriguing thing. Despite being a fire-type expert, his star Pokémon is stated to be Marowak by the Pokémon website. So it seems very likely that Marowak and maybe even Cubone could have a new Alola form that makes them a fire-type. Maybe it'll be like a Hawaiian fire twirler since it always carries its bone and would fit Kiave's dancing theme. And besides that, every Alola form Pokemon revealed so far has been from the first generation. Kiave studies traditional dances that have been passed down in the Alola region. He seems to be all about dancing as he states that his trial will focus on the trainer's observation. The player will see one dance and then another. Thanks to a released screenshot, we see the trial is to find the difference between the two. We're not exactly sure how this trial could involve Pokémon other than watching them dance, but all of the trials seem quite varied so far. We see in the Japanese footage that there's even a stone circle on top of the volcano which may serve as the dancing stage. Once the player has completed a trial, they can then challenge a special Pokémon known as a Totem Pokémon. They are much larger than others of its species and it emanates a special aura. The first Totem Pokémon shown is Gumshoes, whose aura increases its defense. It then calls in a Young Goose to aid it in battle, making it a two-on-one fight against the player and ensuring that your Pokémon will take two hits each turn. According to the Pokémon website, these two-on-one fights are called SOS battles. Every Totem Pokémon can do this, making them even more powerful. But other Pokémon seem to be able to do this too. We'd imagine, based on its description, that Vikavolt can use this technique, calling in a Charger Bug to help power its electric attacks. And considering it's called an SOS battle, we think that this call for help doesn't happen until the opposing Pokémon's health dips below half. The Japanese trailer shows more of the Totem Gumshoes battle. It jumps from a ledge to land in front of the player, but we can see a gold Pokeball nearby, indicating that it's a TM. The question is whether it simply must be collected after beating Gumshoes, or if it's the reward which must be reached afterward. If it's the latter, then there may be a TM behind every Totem Pokémon. But there's something else behind Gumshoes as it performs its flip. It seems to be an altar of some kind, which may be where you collect your proof of defeating Gumshoes. This trailer even shows another Totem Pokémon battle against the already confirmed Lurantis. Unfortunately, we can't see if there's a TM ball behind it or an altar, but it is the same type as Mallow's specialty. After all, we know both Lurantis and Mallow are based in the lush jungle. So that begs the question, who does Gumshoes belong to? Do the Totem Pokémon always match with the Trial Captain, or can they be different? If they are the same, then that means there's a trial captain out there who specializes in normal Pokémon and may be the sole captain of Mele Mele Island. Our only reference to when each is fought is the fact that both Pikachu and Litten are level 15 when fighting Gumshoes, while Solandit is level 25 when battling Lurantis. Though difficult to pinpoint, this could mean that Mallow is the second trial captain that players will face, but we obviously can't say that with complete certainty. What we do know is that once every trial on an island is completed, the final challenge is against the island's kahuna in a battle called the Grand Trial. If the challenger succeeds in this battle, he or she will be publicly recognized as having cleared all of the island's trials and can move on to the next island. In the case of Mele Mele Island, the kahuna is Hala. We knew this before, but now we have proper context for this role. The kahuna of an island not only governs it, but is chosen by the guardian deity Pokémon of that island. So Tapu Koko chose Hala as the kahuna of Mele Mele Island. 
Hala is also confirmed to be Hal's grandfather and is known to be quite skilled throughout all of Alola. We don't actually see any of Hala's Pokemon, but we do see that he has three on his team. Considering we saw Tapu Koko appear in front of Hala in the previous trailer, we wonder if each Kahuna uses their Guardian Deity Pokemon on their team. We're not entirely sure of this theory though, as Sun and Moon has made it seem like there's only one Guardian Deity on each island. So how would the player catch Tapu Koko if Hala already had it? Perhaps Tapu Koko appears after you defeat Hala's Pokemon in order to test you itself. During the Japanese trailer, there's a scene where a villager announces that Hala is on his way there. In the background, we can see Professor Kukui, Lily, and the trainer. This may take place before Hala gives you your first Pokemon and how arrives on the scene a little late. In fact, the more we see how the structure of Sun and Moon will be different to past games, the more we believe that Lily will be your other rival who chooses the Pokemon that's strong against your starter. She may not like to battle, but the island challenge isn't all about battles unlike the gym challenge. Another scene shows the three kids talking to Hala near a green fence. This fence seems to be near the center of the main city of Mele Mele Island. Hala is talking about how he goes to various places and how encountering different people and Pokemon is always interesting. As he's talking, we can see a Tauros walking by in the background. Do they just wander around or did Hala arrive on one? Finally, during the battle sequence where Hala challenges the trainer, we can see a new Z-Ring on his wrist under his shirt. This is the first time we've ever seen him with the ring, so is it possible that players will receive the Z-Ring after defeating Hala? Well, we actually find this out very soon. But what is the Z-Ring? Well, it's the device that we've seen on the trainer's wrists in previous trailers. Within each Z-Ring are Z-Crystals that can be set into it. And if a Pokemon holds the same kind of Z-Crystal, the two crystals will resonate with each other. Each crystal corresponds to each of the Pokemon types. Once this is done, powerful Z-Moves can be performed during battle. Z-Moves are attacks of immense power that can only be used once per battle. It's said that when the trainer and Pokemon's wishes resonate together, they can unleash their full power with the Z-Move and every Pokemon is able to use these moves. However, there are two conditions to use a Z-Move. First, a Pokemon must learn a move of the same type as a Z-Crystal, and second, it must be holding the corresponding crystal. So it seems as if Pokemon like Snorlax can use many different crystals depending on its moveset. After all, it can learn Flamethrower, Solar Beam, Surf, and Thunderbolt, giving it access to all of the Z-Moves shown during the trailer. There's a lot of strategy that can be used for your team depending on what moves your team knows. Beyond the Sun and Moon games, Tomy International is also releasing a Z-Ring accessory that will interact with the games by lighting up and emitting sounds when the player uses a Z-Move in the game. It's mostly fluff, but a pre-order site for the accessory has provided more images of the Z-Ring where we can see that crystals can be slotted into the ring. We only see five in the photo, but looking at the ring in the trailer shows us that there are seven slots in total, one on the top and three on each side, which makes sense considering extra crystals are sold in packs of three. That makes enough crystals for each Pokemon on your team. We assume that the crystal that you want to use is removed from the side slot and placed in the top slot in order to activate that Z-Move. However, what's most important here is that this very likely confirms the return of Mega Evolution. We pointed out in the previous analysis how we could see a circular slot on the back of the Z-Ring, which would perfectly fit a Mega Evolution Keystone. With that, all the player would have to do is give the Mega Stone to the right Pokemon. Everything has its place. It would also be up to the player to decide whether Mega Evolution or a Z-Move works best for a particular Pokemon. During the Japanese trailer, we get a closer look at the Electric Z-Crystal. It resembles a lightning bolt, but as it twirls, it also can look like a stylized Z. But the more important scene comes next where Hala is actually talking about the Z-Ring and stating how it comes from some group known as the Princesses of Pokemon. The mysterious bracelet is able to pull out Z-Power. We then see the trainer with the Z-Ring on his wrist. Based on this sequence, it looks like we're correct in assuming that Hala gives the player a Z-Ring after defeating him in the Grand Trial. Let's move on to the Z-Moves themselves though. During the trailer, we see the full pose of the trainer. As many thought, he's actually mimicking a lightning bolt in order to power up Pikachu. 
The Z-Ring then grants Pikachu Z-Power, allowing it to unleash its Electric-type Z-Move called Gigavolt Havoc. The move is incredibly powerful, yet still seems affected by the usual stats and typing. After all, the HP bar actually stops as the scene fades to white. So Z-Moves are powerful, but not instant wins in all cases. However, there are a lot of unknowns in this scene. We don't know what Pikachu's level was compared to the Alolan Sandshrew, or what Sandshrew's defense or special defense was. Despite all this, it's quite obvious that a well-timed Z-Move could easily turn the tide of a battle. Next, we see the pose for the Grass Z-Move, which has the trainer act like she's growing like a tree. This triggers the move Bloom Doom and creates a flowery field before a light bursts from under the opposing Pokémon. This absolutely wipes out Poplio, but what's interesting is that it's only level 15. This once again confirms that Hala gives the player the Z-Ring early on. More importantly, it looks like players will receive at least one Z-Crystal quickly as well. The question is, will trainers need to hunt down each Pokémon Z-Crystal like with the Mega Stones, or will they be given new ones as the game progresses? Continuing on, there's the Fire Z-Move pose which has the trainer raise her arms like a fire before gathering it all in her hand and pushing forward. This triggers the Inferno Overdrive, which sends out a huge fireball that engulfs the opposing Pokémon in a massive explosion that even has small explosions within. Finally, there's the Water Z-Move pose, which mimics the ocean waves and triggers the Hydro Vortex attack. This submerges the enemy Pokémon in water before creating a whirlpool that slams them all around. Z-Moves add an interesting dynamic to Pokémon battles, but we're most intrigued by their name. Everything starts with a Z, which really pushes the connection to Zygarde and Alola. Do the Z-Ring and Z-Crystals draw on the power of the Zygarde cells that are hidden all over the region, or is it possible that they're powered by something else? Could Z have another meaning? We doubt it considering how much of a presence Zygarde has had in the trailers for Pokémon Sun and Moon and the X, Y, and Z anime. But that's everything we could find in the latest trailer for Pokémon Sun and Moon. As we approach the worldwide release date, more details are becoming clear and we couldn't be more excited. This is looking to be a very different generation of Pokémon, but we won't have to wait long until more information is released about Sun and Moon, as the Pokémon Company has already confirmed that the next announcement will take place on August 12th. And you know we'll be there with the old analysis machine ready to go. Of course, if we missed anything, let us know in the comments. If you liked this video, be sure to subscribe to keep up with everything we do. Thanks for watching and make sure to stay tuned to Game Explained for more on Pokémon and other things gaming.